Hello, everyone. I am Chris Linfont, your host of the Nest Talk podcast, bringing you another episode of the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the internet. And this week, of course, is a big week in NFL circles because it is the start of the NFL Combine. We are just getting into some of the positional drills happening. Um, they happen today with the wide receivers, tight ends, and uh, some offensive linemen, too. But first, before we go any further, I want to uh, introduce our special guest today. He was on Nest Talk a few weeks ago talking about the Ravens offseason plans, uh, Dominic, a.k.a. Ravens Anatomy. How are you today, Dominic? Great. How are you, Chris? I'm doing well, doing well. Um, so yeah, Dominic, where can the people find you if they're looking for you? Um, on Twitter at Ravens Anatomy, and um, that's pretty much all I got so far. All right, so Dominic um, is a contributor here at, at the Baltimore Feather and Nest Talk. He is a graphic designer as well. Uh, of course, I'm Chris Linfont. You can find me at Chris Linfont if you're looking for the Baltimore Feather on Twitter. You can find it, us at Be More Feather and, of course, at Nest Talk for the Nest Talk podcast. We are on Facebook as well, so search up Nest Talk and the Baltimore Feather on Facebook to find us. And, of course, if you want to subscribe to the Nest Talk podcast, you can do that on either our YouTube page, the Baltimore Feather YouTube page, or directly on Spotify and iTunes and basically every other podcast host that's out there, Overcast, Player.fm, everywhere. Um, make sure you subscribe to get the latest episodes of the Nest Talk podcast as they come out. And of course, as we approach the draft, we're going to have a lot more to talk about. And I think we've got a lot to talk about today. But before we go into the combine, Dominic, there are some Ravens issues that I think we have to discuss. And the first one is mm. going to be, what are we going to do with Matthew Judon? Now, I wrote an article about the situation a couple of days ago, basically outlining my position. But I'd like to hear what you think about the Ravens' possibility of franchise tagging Matthew Judon. And then, of course, if they do franchise tag Judon, do the Ravens trade him afterwards? So what's your general take on that? Um, Honestly, there's not much pass rush market out there. And if there is going to be a pass rusher that, that hits the market, it's going to be hard for that pass rusher to leave whichever team they previously paid for, uh, played for. Sorry. So like just, in Seattle, uh, Shaq Barrett wants to stay with Tampa Bay just because they had such good years. And Matthew Judon, um, it's kind of hard to put a, a finger on it where whether he wants to stay or he wants to, you know, explore his options because on Twitter, you know, he tweets, you know, oh, yeah. uh, like he, he's, he's really like uh, fond of the team. Like how last uh, last time I was on the podcast, we talked about Tony Jefferson before he, he got cut and um, and how uh, he was like such a team guy, like because him, um, Tony Jefferson, Matt Judon. Anthony Levine, they're all part of um, the little group they had. I forgot what it was called, but, you know, they were they were like a tight-knit group. So on Twitter, you know, he he's he seems like, oh, you know, I want to stay. And then sometimes, like, someone tweeted, tweeted at him uh, a few days ago, like, I'm going to tweet every day until I see uh, Matt Judon signed. He's like, you know, it's not me. Don't tweet at me. Tweet at the Ravens, you know. like So it's it's hard to say, like, whether it's going good or where the talks are going. But, um... Personally, I see a lot of value in Judon because he is a big pass rusher. Like I just said, Shaq Barrett might probably go back to the Buccaneers, and um, Jadavion Clowney could possibly go back to the Seahawks. Like both two of like one of the premier pass rushers that are will hit the open market this year. Um, so it's just hard to tell. Yeah, and you know, you bring up that point about Judon on Twitter. He's always been, I think, one of the more cryptic Ravens fans on Twitter. Every time a roster move is made that he might not agree with he always tweets something out that kind of gets Ravens fans riled up um you know Matt Judon I think you're right he provides a lot of value for the Ravens I think that talks have at least broken down to the point where the only viable option to keep him on the team would be to franchise tag him Correct. um yeah. because at this point you know there's if you're getting to this point in the offseason there's no deal done it's there's it's just not going to happen there's no way um, I would love for it to happen. Um, but the salary cap space, the franchise tag would take up for next year is about $16.2 million. That's 52% of what the Ravens have open, um, in their salary cap. So, you know, it's a big price tag, 
but I think it's worth it. Now, do you think, though, that the Ravens would be willing to trade him, though? I don't think I think you talk about that. Would they be willing to trade him if they do franchise tag him? Because you could get value out of that, especially with recent history. I know Jadavion Clowney, was was he tagged and then sent away? And then, he was, yes. With the Texans. Yeah, and there were some others um, that, that had a similar fate. So do you think the Ravens yeah, would be um, open to doing something like that? I think uh, the others were like Frank Clark um, and D Ford yeah. were two of the others. Uh, I saw that earlier on the uh, on the NFL uh, little graphic they had, but um, I think that would be a really good option because I was thinking like scenarios in my head before the podcast. I was just like trying to like put piece together like different scenarios, and I think the draft really is going to be one spot. Like whether it's it's sending a whole bunch of capital up to the top uh maybe three or top two just to get chase young which is probably very yeah. very um like small possibility but it would be really smart because or i mean i don't know how smart it would be because you get chase young who's a premier pass rusher already and you can tell that because of how he's been playing in college just how nick bosa and joey bosa were two and two and uh last year and the year oh, before yeah. and then um so you got chase young as an option and then say you bring in a Vic Beasley, you keep McPhee, then you already have three people that like are pretty pretty uh, tangible and getting getting to the uh, quarterback. Then you add on uh, Dalen Ferguson, just that that's four people who you can really develop and like gain chemistry. Even if McPhee is a little bit on the um on the older side, he can still like teach these younger guys. And then you have you're down to three. Then you gain one more, and those three you know try and teach the system that that uh martindale and martindale just signed the extension which um three years Did he really i missed yeah, that yeah i forget what it was but it was a uh, 3.5 i think three years or something like that so like he's going to be around for a long time and roman had signed an extension pr- like a little bit ago um i think when he was kind of in the in the talks and um so yeah wow you get these uh these younger like you go younger because uh, i think judon if i'm not mistaken is like 28 so yeah, he'll be 28 when the season starts. Right. So, um, you got, you got, uh, well, he is a, a pure mirror pass rusher. So, like, and people were comparing it to Zadarius Smith. I saw Jeff Zerbeck on uh, Twitter earlier today. He mm-hmm. was, he's had Suggs and he had Judon on the opposite side of him, and he got 9.5 sacks, and he got as much, like, and that's like a lot of help on each side, right? Yeah. So, but then Judon, he didn't have anybody on the other side. He had McPhee, which is, you know, an uh, uh, aging vet. You had Jalen Ferguson, who really didn't get to the uh, pass rusher this much. And you had Tyus Bowser that you could have thrown on that side. And so with 9.5 and by himself, like, that's pretty crazy. So say they bring in some um, a different person opposite of Judon, then that, that could really uh, help the pass rush uh, this upcoming year. You know, I do like the idea of, of, of Young from Ohio State, and you're right, he's probably the best. I think he's the best overall prospect in this draft. You know, a lot of people are going to tell you Joe Burrow is, but I think from a, just overall prospects, you know, taking everything away, all, you know, everything that different, not differentiates, but all the arbitrary things of needs, I think Chase Young is going to be the best prospect in this draft. So to get him, it would take a lot of capital. Cincinnati's right. probably going to go quarterback. If Washington goes quarterback too, I think the Ravens, if they could pull off a trade for Judon to Detroit to get that first overall pick, maybe be worth it. But mm, I don't, yes, I, I don't know. Would you get, would you get a first round pick for Judon? I mean, you could get other draft capital and trade up for it, but I don't know. It's going to be difficult. Um, it would, but it would just because of, system, of right. What's that? No, you you. But young, I mean, young in the system would be would be very interesting to watch, though. Um, but yeah, you're right. Um, I like the idea of bringing in Vic Beasley. I know he's not the most popular pass rusher, especially mm-hmm. after the drop in production. But I think he'd be a great value pick for someone next, as long as we have someone next to him as well. And I don't mean Jalen Ferguson or Pernell McPhee. I mean either Matt Judon or if it's if it's somehow young, it's young. Um, but I don't see anybody else in the free agent market or that we could acquire that, you know, would be an upgrade to Junon unless it's someone we draft like Young. Um, right. So I I think the $16 million price tag, it, I mean, it's it's high. There's no question it's high. 
especially for, I mean, he, he does only have a career high of 9.5 sacks. He's never had that 10 number, but you know, he's consistently produced more or less more and more every year. I mean, he had one outlier year. I think his second year, we had more production than his third. Um, but he had, he's coming off his best year, a pro bowl nod. I think putting him on that franchise tag, especially with the amount of money we currently have in, in cap space is doable. And we don't have a lot of holes elsewhere, so we're not going to be spending, I think, an exorbitant amount in free agency. And of course, we could cut um, Brandon Carr. I think that frees up another five million dollars, about. So, yeah, not saying we should here. cut Brandon Carr, but we have that alternative if we had to do that. Um, but yeah. from the from the money side, do you think the sixteen million is is too much for Judon, or do you think that's a fair number at this point? So obviously, as a fan or and any football like connoisseur, you would love to get a pass rusher as premier as Judon is, like strictly pass rush. You would love to get him for under, under sixteen, whatever it may be, fourteen, thirteen, even like down to ten. Very improbable, but you would love to get down to that number. So, and I saw also that it was around. If he was a D end, it was sixteen. If he was outside linebacker, it was eighteen. Vice versa, I forget which one. Uh, sorry, uh, I forget which one it was. Like you know, eighteen or, uh, for the outside. But um, so it's obviously, probably um, not to interrupt, but it's probably eighteen for DN because I have here it says sixteen for linebacker. So yeah, so yeah. there you go. So it was uh, whichever he's considered, and you know he does play uh, with his hand on the ground on the outside. But again, the Ravens do play a uh, three-four, and he's sometimes running the. Uh, the middle linebacker spot, like off that, like nickel, um, nickel package or whatever. So they have a lot of options, but um, I, I do think that the the price range would be good to hit. So say we say we drop that sixteen, that fifty two percent of our cap straight on on Judon, then we okay. cut Carr. We do also have um, uh, Imar Marshall in the back who can you know adapt to the uh, the safety spot and then we do have a lot of draft capital so we in the fourth round you know we can develop someone who's lanky like uh i forget the guy from uc davis ashton davis or maybe that's his name ashton davis from cal or something like that i'm not sure where he's uh, mocked or uh, his talent uh, level is but so we get someone like him who's lanky car and who can be versatile like play and um safety so we free up that that capital with car and then we go um and then we grab grab beasley so now we have beasley and uh judon on the edges and we have uh pierce in the middle uh dave um oh i'm blanking now dalen mack oh uh, yeah you can't forget uh, about him because he's he's very promising Justin yeah, Justin Ellis. I heard he was in talks with them, trying to get an extension. Same with uh, Ronnie Stanley and um, oh, yeah. one more player. I forgot. Uh, oh, and Marlon Humphrey's fifth option. They're for sure picking it up. So they're trying to extend him early as well. So that we can talk about later. But you know, like with all this, like these areas, we want to retain instead of fill. So and even in the in the draft, we can you know pick up these these spots. But even if we got rid of Judon which would, you know, keep that 16 mil, we could focus that maybe on a receiver or a linebacker. Um, one of the linebackers that isn't really getting much recognition who's going to be a free agent is uh, Reggie Ragland from uh, Kansas City. Yeah. Went to um, Alabama, and he was a great run stuffer. Like, I watched him a lot, a lot, a lot, right? So and I really wanted him to go to Alabama, or I mean, uh, the Ravens, because that's what they're missing. Like, even though C.J. Mosley was a great um, linebacker in general, he wasn't like the the bat like he didn't hit the holes like Reggie Ragland did. So I feel um that if the Ravens had, you know, put some money in Reggie Ragland, Vic Beasley, and then even drafted you know, moved up as we were talking about, like the Chase Young or even um Zach Bond. Um I, I really like him. And uh Edgar Allen on uh, YouTube did a uh film study on uh, Greenard. Like these are three guys that I really feel like could step in right away and like make some sort of an impact on the, on the Ravens defense. Oh yeah. There's no question about it. I like your point about Raglan. I've always liked him. I think he's a bit underrated, um, but I want to touch. You mentioned Michael Pierce. I completely forgot him when we were doing the outline for this episode. He is a free agent this year. Now, of course, you know, he was essentially um, starting to overtake Brent, 
uh, Brandon Williams' spot, really, as the premier defensive tackle on the Ravens. But after this year, he kind of took a step back, it felt like. Do you see the Ravens re-signing Michael Pierce? Because he is going to be sought after by a lot of teams. There is no long-term deal in place. I mean, they could franchise tag him, but that's not the target of the franchise tag if they're going to use it. So I don't think that's really an option at this point. So what do you think is going to happen with Michael Pierce? Does he hit the market, or do the Ravens come up with something? Um, I think the Ravens... I, I do think the Ravens are going to have a lot of time um, to think about this this uh, this signing, whether they want to re- bring it back, which would be a very smart move because he knows the defense. He know he um, he's going to be able to, you know, uh, stay with Martindale for you know the coming years. And then even if they do re- uh, retain Judon and they get someone in the draft or whatever, then that's going to be like really deadly uh, front four. So I feel like it would be very smart for. Um, for them to bring him back, but if they can't, you know, it's it's a business, and it's it's gonna be used somewhere else. Like Eric DeCasa showed that he's he's ready to win. Like he's he's learned a lot from Ozzy. Like he's ready to go though. He's ready to put his his foot on the gas and like take this team to a championship. So I feel that the Raven, but the Ravens are gonna have a lot of time because I don't see Michael Pierce as being like one of the top top guys that people like need to go out, like the Davion Clownies the Shaq Barrett's again like I don't see him being up there but I do see him being like in the mid-range of like the amount or what people are looking at so the Ravens are gonna have a lot of time it's gonna be a tough decision it's gonna be a lot of money between him and Judon but um I guess we'll have to see yeah spot track evaluates him uh Basically, what they think he's going to get is about four point seven million a year. If you try to keep both him and Judon, that'd be twenty million of that thirty million cap space right there. At least that's it could just be on more. the D line. Yeah, that's just that's just on the D line. So, right. and I think we have to keep in mind the Ravens have a history. I don't remember what year it starts. It's either two thousand eleven or two thousand twelve or something like that. But the Ravens have drafted a defensive tackle every year since that point. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, Dalen Mack on the roster. Obviously, the Ravens want to see more out of him. You got Justin Ellis, who could come back. Uh, and Jihad Ward, you can't forget about Jihad Ward, put in a big year with the Ravens off the street. And you're right, Eric DeCosta is trying to make this team win right now. If he doesn't ha- see that value with Michael Pierce, if he hits the market and his value is too high, then he might just have to go at that point. Even though he's been pretty good with the Ravens, although this year he just really felt like he took a step back. Mm-hmm. Um, but an- another player I want to talk about, before we head into this combine chat is Hayden Hurst. And I don't know if you've been seeing the rumors right lately, but um, someone, I forget what reporter basically said it, but there were talks. Some teams were having talks with the Ravens about potentially acquiring Hayden Hurst in a trade. Now right. we know the Ravens tight end depth and how extreme it is because we have Nick Boyle there. I don't think there's any question. He's the best blocking tight. Well, maybe Kittle is the best blocking tight end, but Boyle is one of the top three blocking tight ends in the national football league. Yeah, we have yeah, Mark Andrews, one of the best receiving tight ends in the national football league. And Hayden Hurst just feels like the odd man out after being picked in that first round. He was supposed to be a hybrid of both. I mean, he's a good player. Don't get me wrong, but he doesn't really excel in either of those areas. You know, he's a, good enough blocker and he's a good enough pass catcher but he's not to the level of either of the two a ravens trade for him could net the ravens um some decent draft capital are you interested in trading hayden hurst and if so what is it going to take for you to give him up like what 100 percent. so um to explain my process is is the two thing the two teams that i saw was the jaguars and the patriots and the patriots they're look, they're in the market for a tight end but i don't know if they're going to give up a second for hayden hurst like that he's no gronkowski he's no uh shoot, he's no uh, Kit, uh kelsey he's no mark andrews even so i don't see them um like stepping up on the value even for a second and then the other team was jacksonville and jacksonville has way bigger fish to fry than a tight end right now especially um with the they don't really have a second running back. They, you know, their quarterback situation is still a little bit shaky. Um, the receivers they got like, I mean, maybe two with um, the emergence of uh, uh, DJ uh, Chark um, yeah. this past year, and then uh, their O line is, you know, obviously their defense needs. To, you know, they got a lot of they got a lot of areas. Got a lot so of I don't holes, know yeah. if they can. I don't know if they can afford dropping that draft. Uh, the draft capital, like the the second, even a first round pick, like I don't know if they can afford that. 
but <clears throat> I do see Hayden Hurst um, more as like a, a an Irv Smith from the Vikings, like a, just like downfield. Same with Evan Ingram. Same with uh, OJ OJ Howard. Like I see all all four of them. Like they could be like uh, very similarly compared just because of their skill sets. Like. Hayden Hurst, when you think of him, he's not really a blocker. It's more of Nick Boyle's job. And then when you see him like as like a mask kind of guy, he that's more of Mark Andrews, like, you know, filling filling a hole, you know, sitting in a spot, uh, being Lamar's first read. That's more of Mark Andrews job. And then the blocking with Nick Boyle. So then you have uh, Hayden Hurst, who's the um, the more of a drag that's like running with Lamar, more of a in route who's running with Lamar, more of a um, with a uh, like across the field kind of like route and he's running with like you see Lamar throw more on the run so it's it's harder for Lamar to think I'm going to Hayden instead of Greg saying like or G Row saying all right Lamar like your first read's going to be uh, the curl to the left or whatever um, the the communication is over there so I think that's where Hayden Hurst um, he kind of falls off from the rest. Um, and I think that if Hayden were to succeed more, it would be Hayden switching to more of a receiver role, more of a slot role. So like you got Mark and um, Nick on the right side lined up with the lineman and then you got Hayden on the left, but it's a two receiver set to the left and then Hayden's inside. So he's more of a slot area because, um, he has the speed, he has the hands, he has like the, again, the, the size for like a tight end, but also, um, and I think that he would excel like in that uh, little sly area. But also, uh, you got to realize we drafted him at 25, and it's been two years, I believe, um, yeah, this was since the we drafted year. him. So, yeah, so he's already 27, and you know, I, I don't know what else uh, he offers for the Ravens. Like we've seen, like the the trio, the dynamic trio that everybody talks about, three headed beast. But um, it's just it's ultimately up to to Eric and to see what we get for him. Like if it's if it's a second, I think I think yes. I say for me personally, if I was Eric in Eric's shoes, if it was a second, I'd be like, nah, we'll think about it and then we'll wait for a first. But if that second is like you know, hey, clock second, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna grab that second because I think that the bigger areas to fill, especially with this the um the guy we're gonna talk about later that uh the tight Uh, drafted even maybe from the xfl so what's that i think i, think I lost you of, there. Um, oh she uh, said something about the I guy we're just... gonna talk about later oh yeah the uh, the combine the tight ends from the combine we're gonna talk about later hmm. and then um uh, we might be able to find someone there even ufas even the xfl so um yeah i think there's a little bit of options uh that we can we can uh weigh you know i like your point i think you mentioned something about Hayden Hurst being more of a downfield threat to some teams that would want to acquire him. And, and people forget, he's actually very fast. If, in that Buffalo game, he hit about, I think it was 20 miles per hour on his yeah. long catch-and-run touchdown. So that's an asset I think a lot of teams would be looking at. I don't think we can get a first-round pick for him. I think his age is probably the biggest roadblock to that. The Ravens haven't really given him enough opportunities either to get that first-round evaluation and maybe if they had, maybe he would even not be considered being traded. But, you know, he just doesn't really fit. And I like your point. He's more of like a drag route guy, a guy to follow Lamar Jackson around the field as a dump-off guy. So he's not going to get a ton of production. Maybe on another team, he would. Um, but I don't think we're going to first. I think if Eric DaCosta gets a second, you know, I like Hayden Hurst. But that second round pick, I think it's just worth more than Hayden Hurst, and it's a business. Yeah. So if the Ravens are offered a second, I think we have to take it and then evaluate what other tight ends we can get in the future. And, of course, we'll go into that on the combine. Um, and speaking of the combine, I, do, I want to talk about the wide receivers first. Um, you know, the quarterbacks are always important, but we're not looking for a quarterback this year. So we're going to kind of skip over them. If there's a quarterback you want to talk about, let me know. Um, um, real quick, I just wanted uh, someone yeah, was saying like that uh, Jalen Hurts was the perfect backup for Lamar, and I was thinking um, that uh, I could possibly be an option. I guess maybe if he's in the later, uh, later second, uh, later second day, 
or uh, even if he's there for the third day, that'd be an interesting option if the Ravens do uh, call out Jalen Hurts' name. That would be very interesting, especially, um, you know, RG3's, I think, 30, 31 now. The injury-prone issue is self-explanatory. Mm-hmm. It'd also be interesting because Trace McStorley is still on the roster, so that might signal exactly. a Ravens not really wanting Trace McSorley anymore or maybe just not really seeing him as a backup quarterback. Maybe they still want to try him out as a Taysom Hill type player. Yeah, but Hurts ran a, a 4 5 9 today at the Combine. Mm-hmm. That's the second highest quarterback um, 40 yard dash. The only one above him is Cole McDonald of Hawaii. So, I mean, he's got the speed. He definitely, I mean, it's probably not Lamar's speed. Lamar did not run a 40-yard dash of the combine. Didn't want to be considered a wide receiver or running back, so he didn't run it. So we don't actually right. have an official combine time to compare it to. But, I mean, he's fast. And there's no question, you look at his college tape, he's a similar prospect. I don't think he's as electrifying. I don't think he's as good as a passer as Lamar Jackson is at this point. But he's a very similar guy. Um, right. I don't know if the Ravens would want to leave RG3, though. I'm no, not sure. I... I, I don't see that. And especially like it's kind of like a similar situation down in um in San Diego or not San Diego, uh, L.A. that for the Chargers, because right now their starter is um, Tyra Taylor. So one of the the possible things is that you can bring in Jalen Hurts or I was thinking like personally, like I just I don't know. I've never seen this, but so, like a bring in a P.J. Walker. He's having such a good yeah. uh, time at down in Houston. And if the Chargers bring in. Uh, T- PJ Walker develop like maybe get a lot of stuff from the, the draft like you know focus really hard on the draft and like draft the correct players then you get PJ Walker bringing him up next year or not bring him up but you know start him next year and have Tyrod um, back him up then you see what PJ what like and you could have something similar from you know the the uh, uh, West Coast uh, Ravens you know I, I don't know like it's just it's like Little like little details that I'm kind of like just looking around the NFL just to see uh, different players. I love that idea. You know, it's interesting because I didn't even realize Tyrod Taylor is on the LA Chargers. Um, yeah. You know, he really is that kind of quarterback. I think he was a little before his time um, because you know the Ravens really had no use for him when Flacco was in his prime, and exactly. you know playing with Buffalo, he was okay. But maybe if a team took him seriously. From the outset, he could be better. Bringing in a guy like PJ Walker, who's having—I mean, I, I, I love watching PJ Walker in the XFL. I've, I've loved it so far. He's just so electrifying. It's so fun to watch. He's it's really like Lamar. electrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if they would give him the chance to start, but I would absolutely love to see it. I think, you know, the XFL. Say what you will about it, whether it's going to last long term. But there's some players that are showing out: Cardell Jones, PJ Walker. Uh, I think there's another quarterback I'm blanking on who I was impressed with. But, you know, there are some guys in that league that could really do some damage in the NFL, and P.J. Walker would be very interesting. And a Jalen Hurts, if you draft Jalen Hurts and sign P.J. Walker, and you could draft Jalen Hurts in, like, the fourth round. No one's going to take him anywhere right. before the third. Maybe, I mean, maybe the second, but he's probably a third or fourth round prospect. You could draft him somewhere in there and bring up P.J. Walker and start Tyrod Taylor and say, okay, one of you two players has to be the starter at some point or this experiment ends. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'd be very, very interesting. The Chargers, if they wanted a top tier quarterback in this draft to say, you know, they're they're picking at six above them. Player uh, teams, potentially in the quarterback market, Miami, Washington, Cincinnati. There's also I've heard rumors that Matthew Stafford might be traded. I mm-hmm. originally yeah, got that down. from my friend and um occasional podcast co-host Nick Sparber, and then it started appearing in the media. Um, so that could happen. So there could be everybody but the Giants ahead of them potentially in the quarterback market. So, you know, falling back on the Jalen Hurts idea would not be the worst decision. I think if they wanted to try to replicate the Ravens, he'd be the best quarterback in the draft to do it. And then, of course, picking up Walker would be very cool. Um, but moving on now into the wide receivers, because they're the big ones with Ravens implications today. If I could start off, I'd like to say that I don't know if we need a speed guy because we have Marquise Brown, um, but I'm very impressed by Henry Ruggs. Mm -hmm. Henry Ruggs III from Alabama. Today he ran a 4-2-7. That was not the only thing he did. He was impressive all throughout the combine. Um, First of all, his measurements, I think, very important to mention off the top of of the uh, 
this discussion here. He's 5'11", so he's not that tall, but he's not that short either. He's 188, arms uh, wingspan, 30 and a half inches, not too bad, 10 and, 10 and 1 eighth inch hands, pretty decent for a wide receiver. Um, that height, though, the 5'11", height shouldn't be that much of a problem. He did a 42-inch vertical jump. He did a broad jump of 131. So he's got versatility. He's fast. Right. Um, didn't do any bench presses. I don't know if the, the wide receivers just didn't do that today or he sat out, um, but he didn't do that. Some scouts are comparing him. I see here with Ted Ginn. Um, he, I think he'd bring an interesting dynamic to the Ravens, although I don't know if they want to add somebody that would serve mainly as a speed guy. So what mm-hmm. are your ta- what's your take on Henry Ruggs? Oh, I would love to have Henry Ruggs um, just because watching him with Alabama, he was just so shifty. And um, him and Judy were just such a compliment to yeah. each other. Uh, whenever it wasn't Judy, it was Ruggs. And then even the third guy, Devonta Smith, who's was uh, unfortunately staying back because he, he was a great um, receiver as well. But um, him, uh, whenever it wasn't Ruggs or Judy, it was Devonta Smith, you know. So all, f- all four or all three of them were just great, uh, great compliments to each other. Um, but personally, my favorite from uh, this week or so far that we've seen uh, in this uh, combine was a uh, Denzel Mims. He ran a four three eight in the yeah. forty, and he said one of his favorite or trait, one of like unknown traits, is his blocking. And <clears throat> I mean, with the, how the Ravens play this year, if they can get a speed guy who runs a four three eight and can block, and he's six three and <clears throat> two oh seven nine and three eight uh, hands. 33 and 7 eighths um, arms, senior, you know, he's ha- he has a lot of experience. Psh, that would be great for the Ravens. Yeah, he had a nice showing uh, at the Combine, definitely. And coming out of that Baylor system, it's an interesting system. I know uh, Matt Rule, the Baylor coach, is now at um, Carolina. But, of course, the, the um, not Pac-12, what is that, the, the Big 12, right. very pass-heavy league. So he definitely had experience in some interesting offenses. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to see what the Ravens could do with him. Where do you think he falls in this draft? Like what round are you just off the top of your head thinking? For uh, him? Mims. Yeah. Um, I would say day two for sure has to be day, day two, two, whether it's second Trouts. or third, but, um, so it just depends on whether, whether the uh, Ravens, what they do in the first round. So I was saying someone like, uh, said, oh, I don't believe the Ravens should go for a, a, a wide receiver in the first round because there's so much depth this year and every that's like one, one the amount of depth in the receiver class and i can see it because I've, I've seen a lot of people say jalen rager um should go to the ravens i've seen a lot of people say t higgins i've seen a lot of people say mims i've seen a lot of people say um i couldn't even name there's so many but um i think that that he is probably a day two guy and that he, but he, I don't know, like his, like when he brought up that, that blocking comment, it really hit because it's like, yeah, like the receivers don't like to do that. And especially if he's willing to like put the team first and put like, okay, I want to block so I can get this ball. And, and I was watching a little bit of film on T Higgins and it seems like they're pretty close to this, like a similar uh, type of size, uh, type of players and like more of like a downfield like get to get to the ball guy and um one of the guys I was like watching the film and he was like you know T Higgins you know he's more of a deep guy he's not going to kill you those routes but he's going to like get down the field get the ball and if we can get that but with a blocking mentality then I think that's perfect fit for the opposite of Marquise Brown and not even to to talk about like the slot area but yeah, I'm a big T. Higgins fan. I, I watching him at Clemson. I was very impressed with the way he played. Um, six four two one six there at the combine. He didn't do any of the drills today. Not sure why he was uh, not participating. But you know, I think someone like T. Higgins, maybe it's Mims either as well, um, might fit that role of let's say Anquan Bolden did a long time ago mm. for the Ravens. I mean, I felt like we That's haven't right. had that big guy that just goes up and gets balls in a while. I mean, we've had C. Smith Sr., who was very feisty, very fierce himself, not a very big guy, kind of it small on the, the smaller side. Yeah, but we, we really haven't had that. We, we've had, I mean, Brashad Perryman was tall, but he wasn't good at all, to be quite honest with you. But I'm happy he's done very well after the fact. 
Um, so somebody like T. Higgins, Mims, I think would be a good second day option. This draft for wide receivers is extremely deep. I mean, there's just right. talent down the board. So the Ravens don't have to go right away with um, someone like T. Higgins. Now, I didn't put this on the um, outline, so I might be catching you off guard here, but I was thinking as we were talking here um, mm-hmm. about linebackers. I know Kenneth Murray is a guy that's been tied to the Ravens over and over and over again in this process. Um, but another linebacker I'm thinking, and I don't know where you would place him on, on your draft evaluation here, whether he's a first rounder or a seventh rounder or whatever, mm-hmm. Terrell Lewis. Number one, he was praising the Ravens, I think, in his press conference today. Number yeah, two, a name Terrell Lewis would yeah. fit so well on the Ravens. It's literally the two best Ravens linebackers ever mix. played. Playing linebacker. I mean, as a Baltimore fan, you can't you just you just want to see what that would be like. So do you have any impressions of either of those two players that you want to talk about? So I think Kenneth Murray's mo- like the most all around uh, linebacker. I think he can do it all. I mean, yes, he's a little bit young. Uh, like a lot of people have been um, explaining because, uh, again, me and Chris are not the biggest like uh, evaluators. We're not like scouts. OK, so. Uh, I just want to get that out of the way, but an amateur. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, I try my but, best. Um, we we yeah, try. We're, we're trying. We're trying. We're trying. Um, but again, so it's like, so what I've seen and gathered is that he's not the uh, the most, or he is the most complete, but he's very young, so he makes a little bit of like little mental mistakes. But I think that with how Martindale was a linebackers coach, I feel like that would be perfect because he can go straight to Martindale and be like, hey, what do I need to work on? They work on it all off season or however much they need to. And it like it, I think it could be a really big jump for him if he goes to the Ravens. Now some uh, a lot of people were talking about um Patrick Queen. And personally I don't I don't see him as a number one draft pick just uh, like on my board personally because he's not like he doesn't get downhill as as easy as everybody else. Like he has to slip a, mo- a lot more blocks, and he's not that great at doing that. So, but he does have the speed to go like from sideline to sideline or whatever. He's kind of like a Devin White, but I would say Devin White was a lot more polished. So, it's uh, it's hard to like evaluate him. And then um, you were talking about Terrell Lewis, and I think that would you know as a Ravens fan, you're like, oh, Terrell mm-hmm. sucks. Ray Lewis, this is the perfect guy. Like, there's no one else. And I, I do see, like, um, but the one thing that the Alabama defense did struggle on, I think Terrell, he's a big body, so he will, like, fill that gap. But I, it can he make the tackle? It, is he physical enough to get downhill and and get in between the gaps and uh, and and perform? So I think that's something he's gonna have to do and uh, and work on with Martindale, but that would be a nice nice little pickup. I don't I don't know where I'd put him um, in terms of round, maybe the third, late second. Uh, it's kind of hard to gauge because yeah. um, you never know what the the NFL draft has in store. So we'll have to yeah, see. and we're a long ways away from the NFL draft. So players, I mean, I remember and Connor. I think it was the. I don't remember what year it was. Maybe it was 2014 or something. Connor Cook was being talked about as one of the best quarterbacks. Ended up going in like the fifth round by the time right. the draft day came. So this is going to change wildly. But Terrell Lewis, I'm looking here at uh, the NFL Draft's official Twitter account. He was tied for the tallest linebacker to measure in 6'5 uh, six, six, and a fourth inch. And he has the longest wingspan as well. Um, so that's interesting. But, you know, can he tackle that's going to be a key thing with him. Um, tight ends also took the field today, and I know we have a tight end here that's interesting. Of course, the Ravens, unless they trade Hayden Hurst, I don't think there'd be any way, unless they trade Hayden Hurst, of course, to go out and get a tight end. It just wouldn't make any sense, but I'm going to butcher this name. I'm so sorry to this guy, but Albert Okwebunum Yeah, I'm going to just let you struggle. <laughs> yeah, Albert Okwebunum. Okay, I think I got it now. He had a pretty good day at the combine. He ran what was it a four? I just saw it all over Twitter when this happened. It was a four was four a six, four, I believe. A if four four six, yeah. Right there, let me check that. Uh, I'm verifying that right now. Four four nine. So four, four nine. 
It's probably four four six unofficially. They changed it as they always do. Well, I um, he was the a top performer. Nine. Yeah, but he was a top performer. Um, the the re- recent best here, according to the NFL's uh, website here, in in recent times was Vernon Davis in two thousand six with a four three eight. He's not that far off from that. He was. Way farther ahead than all the other um, tight ends. Bryson Hopkins came in second with a four six six, um, tied with Stephen Sullivan. So or Stephen Sullivan. So, um, yeah, I mean that right there for a tight end is pretty darn good. Uh, how he fared the rest. I mean that's the highlight of the day. That's the only, the only combine thing he did today. I don't know what the full tight end schedule is. I know uh, quarterbacks and wide receivers did most of the drills, but tight ends did yeah. some as well. Um, he didn't participate in any other things, but the the four four nine makes him very interesting. Uh, he's six five, two fifty eight. He's got um, arm an arm length of thirty four and one eighth inch, and t- hands of ten and a fourth inches. Do you think he'd be someone that the Ravens would be looking into at least? I think the Ravens look into everybody. Like you, you gotta have like the full draft board. Like and be like, okay, like this guy is one of the faster tight ends. He's gonna be up there, especially if the Ravens do. Like this could possibly hinder how teams look at Hayden Hurst because because of his performance against the Bills, where he he caught it, just beelined it straight for the end zone or almost beelined it. He you know that was they showed off pure speed right there. I don't know what they could track on his forty yard dash for there, but like <clears throat> so. But if you have this guy, this uh. A Quinnabomb, then you nailed that first attempt. I don't know. I was I was thinking about it in my head. I was like, oh, <laughs> this up. anyways. <laughs> but um, so if they have a Quinnabomb, then he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna show that that athleticism and that speed that Hayden Hurst that you're like that these teams are looking into um, with Hayden Hurst, especially because Hayden Hurst is third tight end on the Raven depth chart, I believe, or somewhere around there. So now that you got this guy popping up, they're going to be like, hey, like, look, we could trade you uh, third for Hayden, but and and then or uh, we can trade you a third. The Ravens are going to be like, ah, we want a second. We want uh, this as well. Well, it looks like we got this Quinnabomb character on our uh, on our draft spot and it's kind of hindering his his, uh, you know, performance, even though he doesn't have any NFL draft tape. I don't want to take that away from Hayden. So. But like they could kind of like maneuver it, but I do think that if the Ravens do uh, get rid of Hayden, then this guy could be someone on the Ravens draft board, and even Chase Claypool because they were talking about uh, how he could transition to a tight end because he's you know gained all the or not gained weight on the pounds uh, ever since weigh-ins. Yeah, and um, you know I'm it's interesting. I'm looking at his evaluation here on the NFL um nfl.com for the combine Man. they Lance Zerline the NFL's uh NFL Network's analyst on the draft compares mm. him to Mark Andrews which is I mean that's kind of it's just interesting to see how you know that would stack up there so he might be another Mark Andrews but maybe the Ravens would want that if they moved on from Hayden Hurst I'm not sure uh, I want to go back to wide receivers for a second here. I want to touch on Donovan Peoples Jones, okay? Right. Michigan product. He's a guy I've been watching for a couple of years. As, as many of my followers know here, I'm a, I'm a Big Ten football fan because I, I watch Rutgers football, which is very right, painful right, right. sometimes. But um, <laughs> Donovan Peoples Jones, 6'1 one, uh, one and 5 eighths, uh, 212 pounds, 10 and 1 eighth inch hands, a wingspan. Um, I don't know if this is right. Six feet, that six feet seven inch. Okay, six feet seven inch total. Um, four point four eight yard, forty yard dash, four point four five. I'm sorry, forty four point five vertical jump. First among all wide receivers. You know, he's a guy that's probably going to go in the third or fourth round, but I think that there's a lot of value there too. I just wanted to point him out. Do you have any thoughts on him if you're familiar with Peoples Jones? Yeah, so um, one of my friends, he's a Michigan fan. Uh, he hates um, who's a quarterback, freaking uh, Shia uh, LaBeouf. Yeah, yeah, Shea Patterson. And uh, so, um, you know, he's uh, he's always talking to me about uh, Michigan, and I'll turn it on just to you know troll him whenever Wisconsin's playing uh, Michigan or Ohio State is playing Michigan. And they never like lose, this. and you know. It, exactly, because you know, seeing your friends uh, lose is always fun. Anyways, Always. so um, so I, I've seen a little bit of Donovan Peoples-Jones, and 
He kind of reminds me of um, the receiver from USC. I'm blanking on his name. Let me see if he's up here. <clears throat> but he kind of reminds me of um, him as, as well. Um, yeah, I don't see it. But uh, and he's been mocked to the Ravens as well, the uh, the USC receiver. But um, I, I, I do Pittman. see that. Yeah, my, Michael Pittman. So I do see that that, that um, both are kind of like the the outlets down the field though so like they can run a post route he's getting shea patterson's gonna be in a, a bind throw it up and donovan people's jones he's always gonna be there same with um the, in the usc uh state of mind as well so <clears throat> i i uh, he's he's uh i do like that the, his vertical jump is something he excels at because if we can stretch the field with marquis brown speed wise vertically and then donovan people's jones we can stretch him like height wide, like, or, you know, like getting up in the air, beating the, the cornerback to the ball, that type of like vertical, then I don't know that it could be like really deadly, especially with how young these guys are and how, how they could grow together. But um, also in the red zone where uh, people forget Lamar was like fantastic in the red zone. So Absolutely. if Lamar throws a fade up to Donovan people Jones, and there is going to be a fade, um, uh, little thing I, I was hearing uh, Daniel Jeremiah they did that with CD Lamb so there's gonna be a little fade drill um, so we'll see how Donovan Peoples Jones fares in that regards but uh, we'll have to see uh, how this combine plays out yeah we still got a few days to go on it um, you know we're talking about all these big receivers Peoples Jones 6-1 Michael Pittman 6-4 right. T Higgins 6-4 I think how the Ravens go at the receiver position in this draft. And I don't think there's any question that they have to go somewhere um, because they need to add someone new to this. Right. And I don't think there's really many free agents outside of guys. I got to spend a lot of money on that would really do a whole lot for them. So um, I think it really depends upon how they view miles Boykin because miles Boykin, he's one of the big bodies on this Ravens um, receiver core. You're going to have him right. Marquise Brown, Willie Sneed. That's the receiver core for next year. If they keep Seth Roberts, that's four. And, of course, you have Julio Scott as well, who could be a big guy, too. Um, but he's kind of on the outside looking in, I'd say, at this point. He didn't do anything yeah. this past year. Didn't get the opportunity, so it's not really his fault. But um, if the Ravens believe Miles Boykin is taking a large step and that he should be able to maybe even start on the outside, then they might hold off on someone who's bigger and might go maybe for another speedster. So I think Miles Boykin really is going to be kind of the Jenga piece that holds the whole thing together if you can if you get that analogy right you know how yeah, how it all is going to unfold really depends on miles boykin um but yeah there's a lot of combine left here we have offensive linemen that are going to go through you know i was seeing some ravens mock drafts and a few of them a few people were taking offensive tackles in like the early rounds which i thought was really weird because <laughs> I mean, are we, are we just not going to re-sign Ronnie Stanley or something like that? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I kind of doubt that, especially because Ronnie, I think, is essentially saying he wants a team-friendly deal, say, in Baltimore, which would, you know, shout out to him if he does that, because that would be awesome. But um, so today, well, today is actually Thursday. This is being re um, recorded for a Friday release. So when our listeners are listening to this, we will have place kickers, special teamers, offensive linemen, and running backs doing all the drills on Friday. On Saturday, we have defensive linemen and linebackers. And on Sunday, one of the best positions in football to play, defensive back. Um, we'll see the future Ed Reeds, if there are any future Ed Reeds out there. There's a Sunday. guy in, from Georgia with the last name of Reed. I don't remember his first name. Joe Reed, maybe, I believe is his name. There you go. Maybe he is the future Ed Reed. Um, so that's all we have for the Combine. I do want to get your opinion on one more thing, though. I just added this. I always, All my listeners know I add things at the last second to my list here. The, have you been paying attention to the CBA talks, the collective bargaining agreement in the NFL? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm not going to get to the financials with you because that's kind of overly complicated and that's really a player issue. But your general opinion on, I don't think I'm missing anything. If there's a seven team per conference playoff being proposed, this hasn't, correct me if I'm wrong, but this has not been official either not way. I know the owners said, voted yes. The players are debating it. Okay. So we have a seven-team proposed playoff, a uh, seventeen-game season, and a loss of a preseason game. Where do you stand on this? It's kind of dividing the NFL community. 
Um, I think as a like a casual um, viewer, I think they would love this um, because they're probably not paying as close attention as like the fantasy footballers or even the reporters, the journalists, the Baltimore Feather, you know, like the the oh, sure. startup. Um, yeah, so um, I think they would love it just because of how how much more football you're going to get, and it's not necessarily as more because they are going to you know deplete one playoff or a preseason game and add one um regular season but they are also going to add another uh dynamic to the playoff scenario so i think they're going to be like you know like wow by all this like happening and they really didn't even notice notice it um if it does pass but from a player's standpoint and from like a lover of football like how we are here at the Baltimore Feather, yeah. um, people were explaining a really good point. Like I was, I was for it. I was like, you know, if it doesn't happen, doesn't happen. I'm not gonna be mad if it does happen. Wow, that's great. More football and more like more competitive football. But someone brought up a point, and it was uh, injuries that some people can't even see uh, full 16 games. So how are they gonna f- see a full 17 games? Especially like how Lamar Jackson sat out dang near a, a one full game and and some so so to i would probably go with whatever the players want so if they don't want it it's 100 percent fine with me if they do want it you know let's go it's it's football season you know what i'm saying so i mean to me it's not like a big deal but i i did see also something about like real quick the finan- financials like some yeah, players were like on. oh it's it's really uh, it's frustrating how we're only getting a cap or something like uh, JJ Watt was explaining that. So I'm, I'm and I'm not really too uh, familiar with it, so I can't really speak on that. But if if that is kind of, eh, you know, like I'm, I'd probably vote no if I had any say in it. But um, I don't know. It's it's up in the air. It's not really a deciding factor. Oh, if I'm gonna watch football anymore, or oh, I'm gonna hate them if they don't change it to a 17. You know, I'm I'm fine with where it's at, and it's all good to me. Yeah, just to quickly touch on the financials. Um, the the big problem with it for most players is that for a 17 game season, they want 50 percent of the revenue sharing. So all the money mm-hmm. make, the NFL makes 50 percent would go to players. Right now, the NFL is proposing about 48 percent. So I mean, mm-hmm. it's two percent, but at the same time, this is a billion dollar industry, so it's a lot of money for just two percent. Um, right. So that's a big showdown over this. I'm not the big, I mean, I'm coming from more of a standpoint where it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. I don't really see a problem with the way the NFL has conducted its season, its playoffs. I think it's one of the best formats in professional sports. You know, it doesn't drag on like the NBA does. And, you know, it's a, it's not, an, all the elite teams of the conference are going to make it. Occasionally you'll have a team left out like the, what was it? The 2015 Jets went 10 and 6. They didn't make it. Okay. Um, you know, there's a this, lot. Of, it, it happens. This um, past year, I forget, I don't remember which team, but I think they were nine and seven. They didn't. They didn't get through. Uh, I couldn't name it. Yeah. But. Now I'm not the biggest fan of a nine and seven team making it. I think that you know I want the playoffs to be like an elite player, an elite teams club. And I think if we start right. making it, you know, I'm not. I'm not saying it would be terrible, but we could potentially be having eight and eight teams making the playoffs because it, it'd be almost half the teams of each conference making the playoffs or and even this year how it was the cowboys where they were seven and nine and they could have made the playoffs as well along with the eagles yeah. how were not very good uh like and they made the playoffs so yeah i can see where you're taking the same point from there yeah so to me i mean the 17 games i i, I don't necessarily like it a lot i don't especially from the injury standpoint i don't think it'd be you know that great but I'm not super opposed to that. I'm more opposed to the extending of the playoffs. But I mentioned on last week's episode that I thought the only way for a seven-team per conference playoff format to make sense is if if the NFL was planning on expanding. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want basically half the conference making the playoffs. It takes some of the intensity out of the regular season. So I could see the NFL using this as an excuse to expand, let's say, Mexico City, Toronto, London, uh, and maybe Diego. back to St. Louis or San Diego, right? Picking out these markets that want football teams. Right. Um, it probably would be San Diego and St. Louis first, maybe Mexico City and Toronto leaving out London. Right. Uh, so I could definitely see that being the avenue for the way that happens. Of course, that would mean 
division reshuffles and everything like that. Um, but I honestly don't see the CBA being passed. I think that revenue, sh- the revenue thing, the 50% versus 48% is going to be the Achilles heel of it. Mm. If these players play those 17 games and they want the 50%, they're not going to give it up until they get that 50%. And I don't know if the NFL is willing to do that because, you know, the players, there's no NFL without the players. There's no question about that. Right, right. But it does cost a lot of money for the NFL to do this. And remember, this isn't, this isn't profits, 50% of profits. This is 50% of revenue. So everything before expenses. So it, right. I don't know what the NFL's finances are. I don't have that book or anything like that. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's going to be very difficult for them to make this deal, I think. Uh, any last points you want to touch on before we end the episode? Because I think we've exhausted this outline. Yes. Um, so real quick, the uh, the about by going back to the CBA and in the fan uh, point of view, you guys we can't be too greedy because now we have the XFL and now the XFL is bringing more football for longer period of more than one extra game, uh, and we're getting to see a little bit more of like the rookie, the more of the and if if they take the Cam Robinson approach, who is a a player that played his uh, junior year at uh, West Virginia. He was a great safety. He got invited to the combine, and um, for this this upcoming uh, 2020 combine, and he um, he gets to play in the XFL because uh, he got let go from his his school. So maybe we can see more of that urge, like if the XFL can turn something, um, like turn heads. And uh, obviously, there's a super super far red, uh, stretch, but Trevor Lawrence um, getting yeah. like, like over to the XFL. He's so we can't be too greedy, especially if the XFL turns out something like that. Then I would take the XFL and and how develop quote unquote developmental it will be to the NFL rather than a, a one game and and the, the seventeen playoff. So yeah, I I'm I don't know about you, but I'm loving the XFL so far. Yeah, you know, I I, I mistakenly took my hometown, well, not hometown team, but my market team of the New York Guardians, which has not been the best decision of my life uh i probably should have picked the dc defenders but you know here i am now with a sinking team but no seriously i mean there's some really nice football being played in the xfl i love the kickoff returns of the xfl that's the coolest football innovation i think i've seen in a long time it brings excitement back to the kickoff and it prevents really i don't know if anybody's been injured on it maybe someone has but five yards away hitting each other is not the same impact as running down the field and hitting each other. And it's not that different. I mean, I don't know how the NFL never thought of something like this instead of saying, oh, let's just make the kickoffs irrelevant by making them all touchbacks is essentially what the NFL solution was. Instead, Mm -hmm. you know, they found a way to make the kickoffs exciting. We've seen St. Louis scored on a trick play kickoff lateral type thing. I mean, bring back the Jacoby Jones type plays. We're missing that in Baltimore. Love to see that. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. So, you know, I would love to see it implemented. And I like the idea of a developmental league for the NFL. Guys like PJ Walker potentially getting a, a chance in the NFL. Um, yeah. So I think it's all around just a great thing for football in general. Most definitely. All right. Well, I think that's going to conclude episode 67 of Nest Talk. Dominic, I'd love to have you back before, sometime before free agency. We'll, so we'll talk about that uh, soon. Most and, definitely. uh, they can find you at Ravens Anatomy on Twitter. Yes, they can. For the rest of the Baltimore Feather and myself, you can find me personally at Chris Linfont on Twitter. For the Baltimore Feather, you can find us at Be More Feather. Search us on Facebook as well. And of course, Nest Talk at Nest Talk on Twitter. Search us on Facebook as well for Nest Talk. If you're listening to the show, wherever you are listening to it, please subscribe, rate us, follow us, whatever it takes. Uh, and no, seriously, rating us on iTunes, rating us on Spotify helps other listeners find the Nest Talk podcast. So if you enjoy this weekly Raven show, which you know I might be biased, but it is the best and most elite Raven show on the internet. Um, make sure to uh, hit the like button, write us whatever you um, can do there. And of course, that's completely free, just a courtesy for us. Uh, and finally, BaltimoreFeather.com for the latest and greatest Ravens news opinion articles. There'll be more content. I've been a little busy, but there will be more content being published out uh, I know we have some things in the work. Dominic is, is thinking about doing some videos for us as well. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, and of course, we'll do our, our initial draft coverage. Just want to make sure we got past the combine so I can actually do player reviews now 
as we get the full scale numbers in. So, yeah, uh, thanks for coming on the show, Dominic. I really enjoyed talking to you as usual. Of course. And we will be back, or at least I will be back next week for Nest Talk episode 68. Dominic will be back sometime before free agency. So signing off is Chris Linfont and Dominic. See you, See you guys later. Birdland Sports. For fans, by fans. Find more great shows like this at birdlandsports.com.